<laughs> and we are the embodiment of that. And as a kid that grew up a uh, romance novelist, just junkie. I would like sneak and read books I had no business reading as a kid. My mom would find them and I would get in trouble. But as soon as I discovered that there were actually African American authors writing about love, I became obsessed. And that was before, you know, when you're a teenager, before you realize that love can hurt, love can take you through things. But to read, and there's something about a romance novel and a love song that take us to a place of innocence, that take us to a place of hope. And I think that's so important for what we have now. Um, this audience, this entire weekend, is full of just black girl magic, black intellectualism, and so many amazing things. And I think that it's so awesome um, that Tamika Newhouse and the rest of the team saw fit to make sure that we also celebrate love, right? Because so often we talk about it. I mean, we, you meet other black girls, like, what do you do? What do you do? OK, I do this, I have this, I have this, I have this. But at the base of all that, all the accolades, all the money, all the status. If you don't have love in your life, you do not have balance. And I'm not talking about love with a partner. I'm just talking about love. So it starts with self-love, relationships, family. And I feel like so often as black women especially, we don't, we don't highlight that. We come in so busy to, to prove who we are and to prove that we belong and to plant our stamp. And all that's amazing and it's all important. But there's such a necessary need to just say, sister, I love you. I don't care what you have going on. I love you. You're enough as you are. And so that's that's what I am I am I am dedicated to. And so I'm so honored that they chose um, me to host this. I host a relationship show here in Atlanta on Power 108.9 about love. I host a YouTube channel. I talk about love. And I actually was a single mom for about 10 years. And because I kept talking about love and I only talked about what was positive. That became a part of my life, that became a part of my everyday routine, and love found me in, in, a, in a bigger way than I could ever have imagined. So I'm just, I think I'm like the biggest, I call myself a hopeful romantic, I'm the biggest advocate of it, and I'm so excited to be up here with such amazing authors who write about love in various ways, right? So, without further ado, I want to make sure you guys know um, a little bit about these panelists, and then we're going to get into a discussion about how they are motivated and where they find um, that place that they're able to pull from to inspire the rest of us to continue to believe in love. Uh, my first panelist, gosh, these are not in the order that um, ladies are sitting, but the first panelist here we have the beautiful Tia Williams. She is the creator and award winner of the blog Shake Your Beauty. She is also the author of The Axiomal Diva, and which got coverage in the New York Times and Cosmopolitan. She's a co-writer of The Beauty of Color that's directed towards young adults and got significant coverage in Chicks and Sixteen Candles. She is the winner of the African American Literary Award for Best Fiction in 2016. You guys can go ahead and snap and clap for that. <laughs> and her latest novel, Seven Days in June, is a New York Times bestseller and is currently in the process of creating a TV series adaptation with Will Packer Production. Go, girl. <laughs> All right, and next we have We have Denny S. Bryce, and she is an award-winning author of historical fiction. And what I love about uh, Denny is that she's able to tell stories that celebrate just our past and our history, but also weave a little love and romance into that so we can hear those stories that you know tell our history and share about our past, but also from the perspective of <laughs> those loving relationships that make the story go ooh, right? <laughs> So she is most known for Wild Women and the Blues and In the Face of Sun. I think she had, you have your books on? Yeah. Oh, your book stuff? Yes, yeah, she is an adjunct professor for the MFA program at Drexel University. She is also a freelance writer whose work has been published in USA Today, Harper's Bazaar, and Frolic Media. She is a member of the Historical Novel Society, Women's Fiction Writers Association, Tall Pop, and Tall Poppy Writers. She is Amazon's number one best-selling author in African historical fiction as of 2021. Again, a moment for snaps. Snaps, yes. <laughs> she was a finalist in the Romance Writers of America Golden Heart in 2016 and 2018, and also won Romance Writers of America's Golden Heart in 2014. Jenny S. Bryce. Okay. 
Now we have, absolutely, absolutely wrong, Jacqueline Stewart. Jacqueline Stewart is a producer, actress, and author. Her research and teaching about African American film culture and study uh, our origins gain her a significant amount of recognition. She's a co-creator of the LA Rebellion Pres Preservation Project at the UCLA Film and Television Archive. She is the author of Migrating to the Movies, Cinema and Black Urban Modernity, which has received recognition from the Society for Cinema and Media Studies and Black Caucus of the American Library Association. She is the author of LA Rebellion, Creating a New Black Cinema, and her latest book, William Greaves, Filmmaking as a Mission in 2021. Her teaching includes black film as art, black art as film, advanced seminar, senior colloquium, African American cinema since 1970, and Birth of a Nation at the University of Chicago. Jacqueline Stewart. And we're all familiar with Nina Fox. She was just here for the Say Her Name panel. Nina Fox has published over 20 novels, written a few plays and film, a few plays and films, just you know, just so you know, just a few. <laughs> she teaches yoga a couple times a week, which I did not realize she didn't have time to do, and all the other things that she's busy doing. She works tech during the day. She's a frequent speaker at Blur, which is Black Girl Nerd, Black in Technology, and Women's Health. Her work has been nominated for an NAACP Image Award, a doctoral award for innovative fiction, and several African American literary awards. She is the founder of Writer Sisters Summit, a writing and wellness retreat for women of color, and an artist at residence at Brown Soul Productions, Miss Nina Fox. Woo -hoo! Okay, now that we've got all the accolades and introductions out of the way, you guys know who is before you and why they are, they are qualified to speak on writing about love. I want to ask each of you, um, kind of going back to what I said, what motivated you in your writing to make love an important part, love and love stories a part of what you do on a regular basis? Hi, thank you everyone for coming. Um, I'm Atlanta's a different kind of hot, huh? Um, sweating. So I, like you, I grew up uh, obsessed with romance novels. Like my mom had a big thing for them and in, the, in my parents' back room next to the bathtub, she had a pile of 80s paperback romances. This is the 80s, I grew up in the 80s. And they were all really swollen because yeah. of the heat the steam in the bathroom. <laughs> and like, I'll never forget, when you opened one up, it would fall to the sex scene. Yes. Um, <laughs> and so that was my very early romance novel education. And ever since then, I was just always really curious about like grown up stuff. Like, what are they doing in there? Um, and especially since I was such a late bloomer, like I didn't have a boyfriend until I was 18 years old. I was extremely socially awkward. And um, so I would sort of live out my fantasies through these romance novels, but they were all white at the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, not all. There was a few exceptions, but very few. And so in my head, I would recast the characters as black people. Yeah. So like whoever I was into at the time. So like if it's 1988 and I'm 12 and I'm reading A Rose in Winter, the, the male protagonist is Ralph Tresman. <laughs> Which is insane because it's like a big, like, really historical romance. Um, but yeah, and, and I told myself when I grew up I was not going to, I was going to write romances starring us because we're not the black versions of anything. And we're, we're in every space. And it was frustrating to me that I didn't see that. So yeah, that's where it comes from for me. Um, I guess for me, because I did not read romance novels when I was growing up, um, I read historicals. And I'm talking James Michener, those thick things where he started with the first cell in Hawaii. Um, so, um, <laughs> you know what I mean. Um, so, I fell in love with the craft of writing romances because when I first got involved in writing, it was after spending some time writing, and I'll admit this publicly, fan fiction. I was a big fan of secretly writing fan fiction, and my fandom at the time was called, a TV series called Buffy the Vampire yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was a uh, Buffy the Spike, so. Oh, no, no way to okay. But, <laughs> but um, I got very much involved in uh, 
Romance Writers of America and just learning about how to craft a good romance. But then I love history. So I also wanted to, any story to me has relationships. Any story with relationships has a love story, whether it's between um, a man and a woman, two women, two men, um, just history and family and all of these different things that can happen, but there's always something that has to do with love, care, guilt, and all of those things. So, um, and I really enjoy bringing forth, writing about black love in a love story where the characters are flawed, but not because they're black, right. but because they're people. Right. Yes. And um, so those are the stories. Beautiful. And first, Chris, I want to say that that bio you read was awesome, but it belongs to a different Jacqueline. Oh, no. And that is okay. I'm still going to give you what I got. <laughs> <laughs> so, to be honest with you, I can resonate with Tia um, and my sister here. Um, I was a virgin until I was 23. I grew up in the church, and so I mostly fantasized about love and black love. And so I never really read romance books. <coughs> when I was a kid or growing up, but just being in the church and sometimes you feel stifled. And so the only thing that you have is your imagination and, and thinking about that love. But like I said, I was a virgin until I was 23 and I'm actually, the guy who I gave my virginity to, I'm actually married to him today. And so, yeah, so, and, I, and, I, and I'm a military spouse and any of you that are in the military, your spouses, you know how love can be, situations can be. Um, trials, tribulations, but the thing for me is that the reason why I write about love is because I know that it connects with people. You know, it's, it's a, it's a um, general thing that really connects with the heart, especially for women. You know, we love love. And so that's a little bit of the reason why I write about it. For me, my writing is not necessarily always on the surface about love, but the, the desire to write what I think are positive relationships for black people stems from being raised by my father, a black man, who did not remarry until after I left the house, but I always watched the way he treated me, my sisters, and the women he dated all the time. I could tell you some stories about the dating. <laughs> but he, he was always respectful and kind to what he called black queens, and that's important. And because all, so many images of black men in our literature are negative. So I wanted to be anti that. But also, I write about other love. Love between friends and sisters because of the circles that I grew up surrounded in and it's important for us to realize, or for me to realize, what, I, what birthed me and to spread that. But then I've also written um, Erotica as Cinnamon Foster. And what made me want to write this was because when I was getting my MFA, we studied Erotica and all of the people were white. But then our books that were supposed to be Erotica were trashy. Mm -hmm. No, this was I mean, I like to be a trashy novel every now and then too. But the problem with that was, for me, it didn't, the women were over-sexualized in a way that was not characteristic of what they were calling true erotica. So what I wanted to do was write sex that had a reason. Because we have sex for reasons. And it's not always love. Sometimes it's control. Sometimes it's hate. But I needed to portray that. And so that is what motivates me to write Understand why the other moderator was walking down. So yeah. <laughs> uh, but that's that's awesome. And the thing about when you have a lot of intellectuals on the panel is a lot of you guys um, kind of started where I wanted to go next, and that is because a lot of times we don't see. I was a little girl reading. Um, I would read romance novels that were not by African American authors because there weren't a lot, and then I would go and read books, you know, by us. There were very very few. But I realized that the way that, that others write about us was not true to who we are. Mm -hmm. And there was nothing really just like, what's well, just a regular story about just people falling in love. It doesn't have to be a gang member or having like all this thing. It doesn't have to be. I just wanted, I just wanted like a gone with the wind about us, yeah. right? I thought I was like the black scarlet O'Hare. So I want to ask you ladies, when you see it, and it's twofold, because there's one thing is they don't see us the way we are. And often because we have not, we live in a, in a world that doesn't offer that, we don't even see us that way. 
So a lot of times when I would look, what caused me to change, when I would look at what was going on in the conversation of black, about black love from us, I was like, I don't like this either. I, I, there's, this, is not, this is not indicative of what we are. There's nothing wrong with fantasy and creating what you want. And so I want to ask you all, when you look at what you see around you, how do you, how do you I guess, find the balance between writing about reality and then also pushing the reader to want more and to realize more for themselves and their relationships? That's a, that's a tough question. I think sometimes, because of the country we're, we've grown up in, you know, the stories that we're fed in the media that we grow up consuming is telling us that we're a certain kind of person. So, and media is powerful. And so even though you might know that that's not you, you may still have a voice in the back of your head saying, well, but maybe it is. Like, oh, but maybe. I remember, um, what was that show with the um, cops and the bad boys, bad boys? Miami Vice? No, no, we love Miami Vice. <laughs> cops. 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 And I don't know if you guys remember cops, but it was like every Sunday just showing us all these black men like brutally arrested for being like yeah. savages. And you know, I know that's not true, but it's fed into you so much. I will never forget. I went to a concert. I'm from DC. I went to a concert and I saw a group of black guys my age. I was a teenager and they looked a little thuggy. I was scared. I was scared of my own brothers. It was horrible. And it's because of the show. <laughs> and it's because of what we were fed. And it's because of, God, that movie. Um, I used to watch all the time as a kid, Avengers and Babysitting. And they <laughs> they go off the beaten path with the babysitter to like downtown Detroit. And like the music changes to like crazy sax and like the scary black people come out of the shadows. It's like, this is what we're taught. Um, that was not my reality at all. Like like all of us, you come from a black family with all different kinds of black people. We're everything, we inhabit every space. Some of us are boring, some of us are flies, some of us are slutty, some of us are square, some of us are nerds, we're dorks, we're everything. And so what I do in my books is I don't intentionally try to capture all different walks of life. I capture what I see, and in that, that is the black experience, because who's to say there's just one? So if you're a black person writing a black story, that's us. Whether it's a Western, whether it's a fantasy, whether if your black person is actually a unicorn, you know, it's if it's coming from you, that's real and that's authentic. So I don't really I never really thought too much about I want this to be different than the baby mama drama, you know, romance novels. I, I, I don't have baby mama drama. So. <laughs> Thank God. I am a baby mama. <laughs> we co-parent very well. Um, that was a very tough question uh, because I think about um, two things came to mind immediately. Uh, there's an organization called The Color of Change. And um, I met some of the people in this organization a few years ago when I was at the Sundance Film Festival. And part of their mission is to um, really work with TV and other entities to pull, pull them away from the stereotypical police drama where if you notice a, a show like Criminal Minds, very popular, how many black women were the victim in that show, for example. Um, there are some things that happen that almost feed into the back of your brain, like watching TV series. I mean, I'm going to show my age a little bit here, but my grandmother would sit us down when we were little kids to watch whatever black person was appearing on TV, because this was a major event. This was incredibly important. But then if you think about the magazines, the newspapers, the headlines, the films, that if you go back and say, what's your favorite film, if you happen to remember a film in the 1970s, for example, and it might be The Godfather, it might be Star Wars, but where were those black characters then? 
I had, um, I, I was, um, did a fellowship with a group called Tim House, and one of the instructors was a man named Matt Johnson, and he said to me, you don't, he said, really think through your characters so you don't put caricatures of black people on the page. Mm -hmm. And he's talking, a black man talking to a black woman, but that's because we have been indoctrinated with media and all sorts of different communications that tell you who you are or tell you their version of who you are. And sometimes you can't help but have some of that in the back of your mind. I was blessed with my first two books, even though she's moved on, with the black editor, one of the few in New York. Um, she's now at Berkeley, her name is Essie Soga. And she would say to me, because I'd be writing these great stories, great stories, and she said, make sure you are honest about your black male characters. Make sure that your women are not just picked up off the page of a recent magazine. Um, you have to dig deep to um, get rid of the things that we say white people are saying about black people because we're we're being inundated with it as well. So to get to that that pure spot takes thought and research and I think that's why I do historicals because there's so much there's more than what we call painful um, out of historical and there's certain um, stories that need to be told about enslaved in that time period. But there's also stories that can be a mystery with characters that are joyful, treacherous, funny, and all sorts of other things that can be put on the page. Now, I think that even though we, we do see a lot through media, and especially now social media, and we're constantly bombarded with those images and with those stories of people that are not necessarily our culture, but I believe it's all about what resonates with your soul even though you may see these images that the media is trying to put out um, about our culture and the way that we love and supposed to love in our homes, um, you know, it, it, it's all about what resonates with your spirit, what is authentic to you, what clicks with you, what story, and I know some people say the universe, I say God, so what stories are really God pouring into you about love? And I think for me, um, it's all, like my parents, they have been married for 38 years. So that was in my home. My grandparents were married for many years, okay, until my grandfather died. Even my sister, she's been married for over 20 years. And so I think those stories I was able to kind of pick because I, I, I've had those images and those situations in my home and growing up. And even though, and this is me. I know that it's important that we study certain things and certain characters and certain people and certain writers, but I believe that it's important that, that we study self. You know, we have to study self because that's the only way that we're going to be able to write an authentic story about our love, our culture, our relationships, um, even loving ourselves as women. We have to be self-aware. We have to know what we want and we have to be willing to study who we are and really, um, you know, not be afraid to put ourselves out there, our stories out there, even if it may be different from what we see in the medium. And so for me, like I said, it really came from relationships in my home that were not perfect, but lasted many years and are still lasting. And so I was able to pick from those things, even though I may have seen some other things that were not so favorable to our culture and love and the men and women, you know, in our society and who we connect with. So for me, again, it's just all about seeing what's in, in your home, what's in yourself, and then just allowing yourself to write about those things. So for me, y'all heard in the other panel, I'm the mother of five, five children. I'm the mother of sons, I'm the mother of daughters. So the same way we learned about relationships and love, some things, not everything. From what we've read growing up, their pe those people, and the people like my sons and daughters are learning from what I write as well. So that always stays with me, but by the same token, characters that are not flawed are boring. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> these people, 
people that are learning to love and do it, there's a context in which they live. Loving is only one of the things they do, but they also bring with them their church upbringing. I wrote a character who was set to inherit a bunch of money if she would just have sex. And she couldn't do it. She didn't know why, but it was because of her church and upbringing that stayed with her, and that was not what she was taught. So all of the characters don't exist in the back background. I want to write people who bring things with them, whether it is your church upbringing, whether it was how you saw a relationship in your family, your fear of sharing your stuff. I wrote a, camp, a female character who didn't want to get married, but she was very successful and she didn't want to share her stuff. So, I mean, all of those people bring things with them and that's important. It impacts the way they love, the way they work, the way they play. But I think it's important to take all those things into account because it's a greater responsibility than just, I wrote a story. I had children and it's a mirror. I was always very cognizant of um, what I was showing them. And as a researcher, words had power. Like I could bring you into my lab and I could say, this is a good thing, ain't it? Or I can say, well, tell me what you think about this. What do you see here? And those two things are different. It's the same thing as me saying, I'm a mother of five. And I'm gonna tell you this. My kids had three different dads. Now, I'm gonna tell you this. I adopted one, I had one, and my husband brought three to the marriage. Now those two statements made you think very different things. It's the same thing on the page. Mm -hmm. Okay, Nina. Okay. Uh, you know, love stories, the ones that stick with us, you know, you remember those 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 romance novels or those even movies, you know, Love Jones, you see Nina. I can't remember uh, Nia Long's character's name or Lorenz Tate. That just is there's some there's a chemistry that is there that makes people just, first of all, probably put themselves in that character's position and they just, and we love a good love story. We even, I think we try to put celebrities in there so we want to connect us, but the thing about celebrities is real life, right? So they break up and we have to move on. But characters in a book or characters in a movie that, that are written, there's something about that chemistry that makes us root for them, that makes us hope for them, that makes us love with them that is so special. And so I wanna ask each of you ladies, what is your personal formula for creating that, that, that dynamic that makes the reader just like, I understand we're excited about everything else happening, but what about, what, what about what's he gonna say to her next? And when is she gonna give in? And what creates that dichotomy that keeps the reader connected and makes them wanna root for that couple, makes them want love for that couple? And I think when they want love for the couple, they see themselves and want love for themselves. So what is your personal formula for creating that, that love relationship or that loving you know, back and forth that, that is gonna get the reader hooked and keep them rooting for that couple? It has a different way of getting there. Um, and it's really, it's really a personal style conversation. Um, but for me, I, the thing that drives me insane about um, uh, some romance novels is when you're just told that the characters are in love or it's like, you know Really a love at first sight kind of situation and I don't want to be told I want to be shown because I feel like that's how you get more invested and For me, I really want to build a case for this couple. So by the time they like make it happen you're dead on the floor. You're just like, <laughs> half, it's page 200, what, like, and you're just on fire. I love torturing the reader. Yes, <laughs> I, yes. I, I do. Um, and the way that I build the case is dialogue, which is my absolute favorite thing to do, like bantery dialogue, you know, things that we would never say in real life because our brains don't work that fast. You know, it's the stuff that you, yeah, the stuff that you think of in the shower 18 hours later. Um, yeah, exactly. I should have done this. I should have said, um, yeah, for me, it's like the talking. Like, I could just write endless scenes of people talking in rooms. Um, and I, I, it's probably my love of words, but watching people fall in love through words and connecting in that way um, get, gets it gets the heat going for me. And as a romance writer, what you think is hot is what the reader will think is hot. Everyone's talking about tropes now, like tropes are the big thing. What is it? Is it a um, enemies to lover? Is it a second chance romance? Tropes are really fun, but your, your book should be a lot more than that. Like don't rely on the mechanism of 
it's a second chance romance. They were in love before, now they have a chance again. It's like, okay, but tell me why. Like, why is it the two of them? Um, yeah, so that's, that's my way. Well, this is really hard for me um, because in my stories, the love story is, is definitely uh, woven into uh, a, I guess you'd say, the historical content of, of the story. But two, two of my favorite approaches, because I have two books, so I'll just talk about my two favorite approaches. Um, in the first book, it had to do with conflict. Um, it had to do with the history that the couple had. But it also had to do with how they stood in a room. And this is gonna sound a little crazy because of my past very many, a few years ago, I was a professional dancer. And I danced in New York and I danced with Ailey. So there's something to me about people standing still and moving at the same time. Being able to get that on the page is something that excites me, trying to have something about them that is just, they, they're drawn together. So there's that. <laughs> um, the other um, thing is something I, I, you know, a character in my second book, they meet each other when he's at his most vulnerable moment, but he's trying to hide it. And she can see through to the other man that's there. And that becomes the foundation for their, their love story that lasts a very long time, even though there's some mess that happens. But in romance, because I spent a lot of time studying the craft of romance, what a good romance writer can do and, and is not only tell you a love story, but tell you why these people should never be apart. There's something that keeps bringing them back, keeps drawing them back together. Um, so I'm just going to throw out some historical romance authors that are some of my favorite. Beverly Jenkins, for example, I don't know if you've read her, but amazing. And um, Vanessa Riley is another one. Um, it's just that ability to keep a reader turning the page, because you know how it's going to end. A romance has a happy ever after. If it doesn't have a happy ever after, it can't be called a romance. But keep reading and you're just like, oh, this person is so deep, this couple is so important for them to be together. Um, for me, it's all about emotional, mental, and spiritual tug of war between the characters. Um, drama, I know a lot of times we think that drama is bad, but it really, for me, it just builds a story. Um, it just creates a, a more of a connection with the love, and I believe it's something that when the reader reads, they can really feel the intensity of the characters. They can really feel that emotional, mental, and spiritual connection that the characters have. Um, even if the characters really don't get to that love to the end of the story. Um, and she, like she said, a little bit of con conflict, um, but I love just building that, that tug of war, some misunderstandings, of course, because we know that love has misunderstandings. Real love, okay? Um, it has misunderstandings. So for me, it's just that simple. Again, that, that emotional, mental, spiritual tug of war, misunderstanding, some drama in a good way, and uh, a little bit of conflict just to, so that, that you can feel the tug and the pull of the love and the coming together of those two characters. So what they said. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, yeah, it's back to all of, it's all about context. The characters can't exist in the vacuum. I want, you want them to win somewhere. So you know the things that are going on in their lives and you want them to win somewhere, you're rooting for them and you're happy when you see them come together because you understand what motivated them to pull away, to come together. Um, and this summer I hired a social media intern and she asked me, she's a young lady that just graduated uh, with a degree in English literature, and she said, Do you, can you send me a character outline of your character so I can put together um, mood boards to use on social media? And I said, oh yeah, here you go, and I explored it and I gave it to her. I've come a long way in my career because when I started out, I was a pantser. Do you know what a pantser is? So I would just, what's supposed to happen next? And I would write it maybe three quarters of the way through, I might outline and say, okay, this is what's supposed to happen next. Here's a lag, here you're changing around. So for me, it was a big deal. I said, oh yeah, here you go, here's your character outline. I, because, and they could tell from that, she was able to draw mood boards that said, 
this is where they come from, this is what they're motivated for, because it was all right there on the paper, and that really helps in the story. So context and understanding. that and all of those you know gave us a little bit of a different answer but it all boils down to those that conflict and that, that push pull that keeps us connected i'm gonna go off script a little bit and ask you guys something because as a black writer talking to black writers amongst other black writers and readers um i think it, at, at black writers weekend i have to ask this question because it's something i struggled with early on i started writing when i was like in, in the elementary school don't ask me about those books um, but they did, one of them did involve me and my four friends all falling in love with the cast, but the entire group of New Edition. Yes. <laughs> I was with Mario Yeah, so you had Robert Frost, I was in Mario Um But I, and it's, so I would write, I, you know, when you're, when you're a reader, you automatically, you would write. I didn't think I would ever actually publish books, but I, I, I wanted to write and do what I was reading. And I remember all the books that I would read, when they would, because romance books, you have to show how, the one character is so beautiful, right? And then the, the other character, at that point, we just were very, it was very, uh, very, very vanilla. We had a man and a woman. So the woman was always desperately beautiful. The man is always unbelievably handsome. And there was a very strict look for that, right? So her, you know, light, vanilla colored skin, or her cafe olay <laughs> colored skin against her long, curly, wavy tresses. And I remember I was writing, and my first main character in my book did not look anything like me because, wow. because I never, it never was described in the book that a brown, just a brown, just a nut brown girl, right, with kinky hair, kinky braids at that point, I was still in braids, was beautiful. That was not considered beautiful, right? And so I remember writing the book, and the, the character didn't look anything like me. She was very light skinned, she had green eyes and long brown hair. And then I went back and I was like, but that's not, that's not me and my friends, you know? And so for the next time, I tried to write from the perspective of, of a woman that looked like me or a girl that looked like me being beautiful. And that was so hard because I hadn't read it. And this is, you know, I, I, I was born in, in the late 70s, grew up in the 80s, so at that point it wasn't there. When you read books today, things are very different. But I want to ask you all about your journey as you as we know, because we all come from a place where that wasn't the norm, and things have shifted, but they're, but we're a part of that. So can you talk a little bit about how you, how you develop those characters, especially when it comes to the aesthetic, because that was something that even black authors at one point, black writers for television, film, would write very specifically to a certain aesthetic that was considered beautiful and acceptable. And we have done so much to break down those barriers, but I think we have to talk about the conversation that got us here. So how do you approach the description of your characters and how do you, how do you, you know, where do you, where do you come where do you find the motivation for that? And do you find yourself going against what you might have read early on? I mean, yeah, it, I have to go against what I read early on because it was, you know, not there. It was alabaster skin, it was flaxen hair, it was pink nipples. Yeah. <laughs> Some of us have pink nipples. Many of us don't. Um, and yeah, so it's tough because the early black authors who were writing romance were describing, you know, very light skin black women. It's funny because men didn't have to be light skin. It's better if the men are dark skin because that represents masculinity. Um, and, and they were doing that because they knew that that was our collective understanding of what is beautiful. And romance is supposed to be a fantasy, so we're supposed to be fantasizing about these people. And is there anything to fantasize when your skin is not brown? So, which is um, many layers of frustrating. When I wrote my first novel, The Excellent Diva, it came out in 2004, and there was a huge discussion about the cover. Um, it was right when we were coming out of like the 90s, Terry McMillan, those fabulous like angular colored, you know, <laughs> covers with like a woman who was a triangle and had like a, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like the very graphic cover, Eric Jerome Dickey, like. Yes. You know. Um, so now we're coming out of that, it was, it was more like super duper pink chiclet era, but they were like, 
oh, okay, so this is about a fashion editor in a magazine, but she's black, so we're going after the Devil Wears Prada crowd, so we, want, we don't want to scare them. Um, what color is this woman going to be? And they, they had a model call, and they casted the lightest Puerto Rican woman you have ever seen and wouldn't even show her face. It was a leg, and since it was 2004, Sex and the City era, a green Manolo blotting. Um, but she was so light, honestly, she looks white. I mean, I wish I had it to show you guys. And it was like, very uncomfortable for me, because I'm, are we not allowed to occupy those spaces? And what was really frustrating was that I was writing about myself. I was the first black beauty editor at Glamour with very brown skin. So I'm not real, like I have to be presented as the lightest Puerto Rican anyone has ever seen for people to believe that I would even exist in those rooms. It's gross. So I don't really have a, I mean, like you said, things have changed so much in the past 20 years. We have Talia Hibbert who's writing about, you know, um, all kinds of bodies with disabilities. We have, you know, my last book, Seven Days in June, is about a woman with an invisible disability. Um, we have different gender expressions. We have different sexuality. We have, you know, uh, a fat heroine with a skinny, you know, hero, and vice versa. You can find anything these days, which is so um, refreshing. But it's you have to wonder at what point is this a trend? And I've seen like black people to be trendy before and then not be trendy. So you've seen us go up and down and out of favor, so I wonder if all of this in inclusivity is going to go out. I think it's our job to make sure that it doesn't. That, the last part, yeah. very <laughs> critically important. Um, but when we're talking about covers and color and my book. And this is a cover that some people, I fought a battle, because I'm traditionally published, my publishers Kensington books. And um, so we had a battle about this particular character, but the story itself is um, 1920s. I don't know how many of you know that uh, if you were a dancer in a club in the 1920s, you had to pass the brown bag test. Mm -hmm. And so my character passed the brown bag test, so she was lighter than the brown bag, so she could get a part in uh, the chorus line. So there, I have very um, color, skin color in the 20s, skin color in the books I write is a thing because it was a thing in the culture of the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so in order to tell that story, um, I don't use the food color, you know, you are chocolate, you are this, you are that. If you're brown, you're brown. If you're black, you're black. If you're dark, you're dark. If you're beautiful, you're beautiful. So I really don't get into that. And it's be probably because I've been in the business and I'm also a reviewer. Of, I'm a book critic for NPR. And being able to dig in and just tell a story. And I don't need the, um, the white writer nicety of giving you a food color to describe, <laughs> to describe how you look. <laughs> so um, yeah, the journey is interesting. It's, ch it's changing. Um, it, I am praying it's not a trend, but I'm also working to ensure um, Events like this one are critically important. Readers are critically important. Going to your, buying these books, reviewing these books, Goodreads is a power broker in this business. If you like a book, go find that author on Goodreads and, and, and just say this is a fabulous book and you should get it. Same thing goes with Amazon. There's a business here that needs to continue to keep pushing. Um, I don't want to talk further, but one quick answer. When her book, um, Angie Thomas wrote The Hate I Did, You Did, La 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 La, when her book was up for a bidding at one of the major houses in New York, and um, an editor wrote about this just two years ago, and he said that the 
vice president of this particular entity said, black folks don't read, so we don't need to pay that much money for this book. Okay, so I'll be really quick. I think for me, of course growing up, um, uh, the way I would say the, the way the world talks and what we see for me, it was always I had to be light skinned with long hair and a certain certain color of eyes. To me, that was what beauty was. But as I began to love myself, I began to see different shades and different aspects of beauty. And so when I'm writing my characters, it's just simply all about what I see because we as women, men, we are a beautiful culture. We are so dynamic. We're dope. We're wonderful. And so I just write from that dope and wonderful place of who we are as a color, our shades of people. And so it's not about me writing or putting a, a character on the, on the cover because they're light skinned or because they're dark skinned, but it's all about what I see, what connects with the character, what comes to me, and simply what I want the story to be about and what, what, what fits within myself, what is authentic to me. And so that's it in a nutshell. So I feel fun to answer this question. But seriously, like you, I don't write the food. Um, and it never occurred to me that it was a thing. Coming from a family where we've run all shades of the gamut to where my, my, my aunt couldn't walk down the street in Alabama with her uncle because they wanted to know why she was walking with the white man. And he was a white man. So when, you're, when I'm writing, I write the things about them that you see. But also, when you're reading it, we know these people are black by their experiences, what they say they do, the clubs they belong to, the things they say. So until a cover brought attention to, uh, Carper Collins sent me a cover, and they were like, well, here's a story, here's a black man in a cage, and this dark-skinned woman is sitting on it. And I was like, that is not acceptable. But it never occurred to me that this is what those people look like. They put what they thought the people looked like there. Other, it was more about their essence, their being, the things they do, their experiences. Um, to the point where um, this latest book, a net gallery reviewer said, well, those people say things that people of color would say in the South. I was like, well, they're in South Carolina, and they are people of color in the South. So, I mean, and you would know reading it because you know what clubs they belong to, they tell you about their experiences, and you might, you, you might impose, well, he said he loves her curly hair, you might think something but I never wrote that she was the shape of anything. It's more about our collective experience that I'm trying to convey. Love that we can just have this conversation now. Like I think as a young girl writing, I never thought we would be someplace where we could actually talk about this because so many of us were dealing with it on our own. And you take, you know, your book comes back from the editor and it's like, well, this is, you know, you want the book to appeal. So I just love that we, we have an opportunity to have this conversation and to talk it out amongst ourselves. That's just a beautiful thing. I do want to take a moment to ask the audience. I know you guys have some questions for these amazing authors. Questions from the audience? Yes. What do you guys do, like, in your writing to stand out among so many other books in the romance, you know, genre? There's so many books. So how do you, you know, dictate your writing to think be the thing that stands out among so many? I think you can't think about that. I, I don't think, I, probably if you, if you ask your favorite artist, like your favorite singer, like how do you stand out, that they, as soon as you start thinking about the competition, you're screwed. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, you lost. So you have to write the absolute best book you can write. You have to write what tickles you to death. If it's tickling you, it's gonna tickle somebody else. If you write a book, you know, based on a certain style that's, you know, happening or based on a certain genre you wish you could write into, it's, it's not going to win. You take what you do and make it amazing. And the truth of it is there are no new stories. It's how you write them. Um, so I would focus on, on that piece of it. I, I can't add too much to that at all because... Um, Writing is solitary and takes, um, my first book took six years, my second 18 months, my third um, took some time. And then the one I'm working on now has, is due at the end of September. So I don't have time to go check out 
everyone else. I read for pleasure when I have time, but mostly I'm listening to things in the car. So if you get caught up in competition in the writing world, you're not going to get anything done. Mm -hmm. You have to stay in love with what you're writing. Mm -hmm. And also, no one can write the story like you can write it. Meaning, no one can write it the way that you can. Yeah. So just stick to that. Yeah. Whatever you're writing, somebody needs. So your story somebody needs. So don't worry about who's writing this and how they're writing it. But there's somebody that needs your story and no one, just remember that no one can write it like you can write it. And that's why you stand out. Because you wrote it, you're being authentic to your voice. It's yours. Um, I don't necessarily write romance. There's romance in the book that I write, but that's usually not the primary genre I end up in. And that's okay. But I also, like they said, I don't really stop to think about the competition. Because there is no competition. I'm not competing against her. There's room for all of us. And I can only learn from what she did and say, I like this, I didn't like that, and move on. Um, so that's really how I approach it. I'm sure if we're talking to an audience of readers, and, and I, readers have hundreds of books. <laughs> we're not going to be like, oh, I only, I only want to read romance from this person. So. Let me, I got one question here and then one more and then we're, we're gonna, we gotta wrap up. Yes, ma'am. Hi, this question is for Tia. Tia, for fans of The Perfect Mind and Seven Days of June. And just so you know, I'm a DC fan. Do you like her to see you? Oh my God! <laughs> hey. Thank you, girl. So when are we gonna see The Perfect Mind on the big screen or the small screen? Mm. Yes, okay, so The Perfect Mind is going to, oh, sorry. <laughs> Perfect Fine is going to be on Netflix, uh, starring Gabrielle Union and Kate Powers. Um, <laughs> okay, now. That, that's right. Let me tell you, I met him on the set and he called me ma'am and I disintegrated. <laughs> I was like, I have never been older in this moment. Like, I was just like, ma'am, no. Um, anyway, so yeah, so that's going to be spring of 2023. Yeah, and then no date yet on Seven Days in June because we're right at the beginning of all of that. But yeah, it's been option for a TV series. So. Wow. Yeah. 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 Another question right here. Quick question. You know, I'm beginning to realize that to be a good, it seems like in order to be a good writer, I don't know if you guys have experienced this, you almost have to be a psychologist. It's almost like you read a book about the introductory to psychology. <laughs> Do you find that, that in order to write a really good, true character, you have to read something about human nature and what wow. works with, you know, if you want to write something about a murderer, you have to go and read something, you know. Yeah. Research, yeah. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Um, there are, um, I, I, I spend a lot of time researching Psychology Today online, <laughs> I actually go there. And um, figuring out how uh, three sisters, I'm um, essentially, I just have brothers. And um, <laughs> they're good people, but you know, I'm the oldest, so they're younger. And I read about sisters in a family, how they interact, the psychology, the middle sister versus all of that sort of stuff, so yes. There is uh, a little bit of the psychology degree, but there's also um, a resource that I love using is a thing called JSTAR, or JSTOR. Mm -hmm. And what, you can look up um, people's thesis on different time periods. Right now I'm reading about um, how come in the Harlem Renaissance you always hear about the male poets and writers, but you don't know the top five female writers and who was the first in black feminism and back in the 1920s. So these character studies of that time period are also very helpful and useful as well. Oh, I was about to say, I work with people, so I work in the social work field. Also getting my master's for clinical mental health counseling, and I'm an international chaplain for military spouse and sorority. So that lets you know how much I work with people and how you get these stories and you have to know people and connect with people. Um, because your stories have, have to come from somewhere. So I'm an introvert too, but I know that I have to connect with people and know people and study people, so you're right. 
So I, I actually am a psychologist. But I don't think you necessarily have to be that. You have to be a student of human behavior. Yeah. You have to notice the details, and it's not just how people interact. You need all of those things, but you also need to notice how that insecure woman puts her makeup on. How the woman that's flirting, that's her eyes. Two people that don't like each other, or someone who's afraid of someone else for no reason, how they hold their body. So it's about being a student of human nature and watching and being very observant. Right. Um, so in that way, yes, you do. And I think I, I was that before I decided I was going to go get a PhD in this thing. It kind of like the chicken or the egg, I don't know. But, yeah. And for me, I'm not a psychologist and I don't work with people, um, but I'm obsessed with memoir. And I. I am always reading either a memoir or a biography, and I feel like you learn so much about human nature through reading people's stories. Um, and you can meet some amazing characters who you wouldn't meet in your everyday life, and, and then they kind of, your, their stories and their experiences and the way they relate to the world sort of get embedded in your brain and come out in your characters. So that's what I do. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>